The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And welcome to the Exxon, everyone. My name is Rob McConnell, and for the next three hours, I am your host, I am your guide, as together we cross the time-space continuum to this place that I call the Exxon. It's a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. And the Exxon comes to you Monday through Friday from 11 p.m. Eastern until 2 a.m. Eastern right here on the Exxon Broadcast Network and our growing family of broadcast affiliates right around this great big world of ours and on TalkStream Live. If you'd like to send me an email, studio at exxonradiotv.com on all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV. And you can now join the Exxon group site on Facebook by going to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Exxon Radio TV. And of course, our radio website at www.exxonradio.com. My first guest tonight, Exxon Nation, is Matthew Sweeney. Uh, he is a journalist who currently works as a research writer at Penn State. Matt has worked, uh, worked as a reporter and as a music reviewer for several newspapers and online outlets such as centraldaily.com and music.com. He was a contributor to the recently revitalized version of Omni magazine called Omni Reboot. He writes the Antimatter column, which looks like a fringe science and the paranormal for the online magazine. He has also worked on writing projects with Paranormal State's El, uh, El, El Fi Music, Balancing Skepticism with an Open Mind. Matt uses his experience in journalism and interest in both ghost lure and the paranormal to collect and tell stories about the supernatural and joining me now is matt and matt welcome to the x-zone well thank you for having me uh first of all matt uh did i did i uh, kind of uh, mess up your family name if i did i'm terribly sorry yeah it's swain it's it's swain. been handled a lot worse let me let me tell you that well my apologies my friend no problem uh so where did your interest and love for the paranormal come in and how did you tie that with music that's a that's a great story. I'm glad we have an hour. Um, but I was born on Halloween. That's kind of the short story. <laughs> so is my granddaughter. <laughs> oh, nice. And it, I'll tell you, it just gives you a, a greater appreciation mm -hmm. for the weird. I think. Yes. Um, but but what happened for me was uh, later on uh, when I became a journalist. Uh, you know, every Halloween I wanted to have the best Halloween feature story out mm -hmm. there. So. Uh, I would, uh, at least it, uh, for one feature story, what I did was kind of dig into some local ghost stories. And uh, I found a lot of ghost stories from my uh, local area, which is in Tyrone, Pennsylvania. And uh, I wrote a story, but I kind of came up short. And uh, what I decided to do was to take a look at the ghost stories uh, at a nearby university, Penn State, which is where I work now. And what I found was that those there was just tons and tons of these ghost stories at a university, which made me think of, um, you know, typically when we think of a university, we think of students who are going to be rational and 
avoid the supernatural and they're growing up. Mm -hmm. But in this case, I found all these ghost stories and it made me really want to figure out why people told ghost stories. Um, So I ended up writing a book about university ghost stories. And then through a a talk with the the publisher, uh, I've always had a great love for rock and roll. I had some uh, inkling that there were some rock and roll ghost stories out there. I heard a few about Elvis Presley. Yeah. So I delved into it a little deeper, uh, and and lucky, luckily people like uh, Gary Patterson, who's written about this, uh, kind of paved the way and made it a lot easier for me, and the internet uh, helped as well. Mm-hmm. So I started to research and found just a lot of ghost stories about rock and roll, and that's why I, I wrote the book. And, it, and to be honest with you, it was the, the most fun uh, project I, I've ever worked on in my <laughs> life. So tell me, uh, can you share with us some of the stories that you featured when it came to rock and roll, music, and the paranormal? Sure. I'd like to say that rock and roll is really the only art form that I know of that begins with a ghost story, and that's the story of Robert Johnson. And Robert Johnson was a uh, blues guitar player, and uh, as legend has it, he was not a very good blues guitar player. In fact, he was so bad that uh, the the blues area that he was here, where he was, was the Mississippi Delta, mm-hmm. which um, has the best guitar players probably in the country, maybe in the world. And they kind of tossed him out of, of the um, circle. And uh, according to historical records, he it pretty much disappears from the scene for about a year. And then almost to the day, he reappears in the Delta And this time he is playing guitar like no one else can. He not only has, um, not only can he play the the blues of the masters, but he's just created his own sort of style. And that immediately begins these um, stories and rumors about Robert Johnson that he sold his soul to the devil, which is a legend that uh, at midnight you take your guitar down to the crossroads and a man in black will come up to you and He'll have a contract, you sign it, mm-hmm. he'll re- retune your guitar, and you'll be able to play the blues like nobody's business, but a few years later, he'll come back to take uh, take control of that contract. And the story goes with, with Robert Johnson that a few years of this fame and fortune that he uh, gathered in the Delta, um, he died mysteriously. Uh, he died violently ill and apparently howling to the moon. Mm. Uh, so... The rumor continued, and the story goes that the devil came back to to, uh, take control of that contract with Robert Johnson. So this story uh, begins this kind of rock and roll ghost lore that that continues throughout. So uh, Robert Johnson starts, but then again you have ghost stories about Elvis Presley, uh, ghost stories about Jim Morrison of The Doors, Janis Joplin. There's just reams and reams of it. What's your favorite? Uh, what's your favorite story? I think my favorite story, uh, because it's it has to be the creepiest one, is the story about uh, Jimmy Page, who was the guitar player for Led Zeppelin, yeah. and he bought uh, Alistair Crowley's house uh, called Bulliskin House in in Scotland. It's actually uh, right near uh, Loch Ness, so it's got a lot of mystical things going on with it. But in this case, um, Aleister Crowley, who was, you know, usually called the Beast, I think he called himself the Beast uh, back in the Victorian era, was a uh, an occultist um, and uh, some would say a black magician. He bought the house because he he said it had such a uh, dark uh, feeling and vibe about it that uh, it was it was bound to be haunted. And there were stories, of course. Uh, surrounding this house that it was haunted. There allegedly was a a church that was burned down on the property and all the parishioners died. But Aleister Crowley must have been a a realtor's dream because he bought the house and then later on uh, Jimmy Page bought the house and there were several ghost stories uh, around there. My favorite one was that um, and, and when you do, when you write about uh, rock and roll ghost uh, stories, you have to realize that, uh, you know, rock and roll stars are, are known for partying a little bit. Yeah. So that can affect, uh, you know, the authenticity of these stories. 
But in this case, uh, Jimmy Page was uh, talking to a Rolling Stone uh, magazine journalist and uh, told him told her that a friend of his who was completely straight, uh, didn't do drugs, didn't drink, was staying overnight at his house in Boleskin House. And uh, during the night, he heard this kind of rumpling around in the in the hallway outside of his bedroom. So the next morning, he talked to the caretaker and told the caretaker, look, you know, uh, last night the cats must have been in there fighting, and that's all I heard all night. And the caretaker said, well, there's this story that a person was beheaded in this house and that the head rolled down the hall right by your, your room. Oh, boy. Uh, yeah, so it was it was kind of freaky. The interesting twist to this story is that um, after uh, Jimmy Page had told the story to the reporter, the reporter said, have you ever heard this, you know, head rolling down the hall? And, and Jimmy Page said, no, he never did. And then the reporter said, so you don't believe that, uh, you know, the house is haunted. And he replies kind of cryptically, I didn't say that. I just said I never <laughs> heard the the uh, head rolled down the hall. So it makes you think maybe he saw or heard things uh, that he's not talking about. Well, let me ask you, are you a believer or are you a skeptic? And have you yourself ever had a paranormal experience? That's, that's a great question. And um, some people say I dance around this, but <laughs> I, I really consider myself a skeptic in the, in the truest sense of the word mm -hmm. in that I really don't know. You and I there are going to get along fine. There have been weird things that have happened to me that I, I have to say they're weird, but I don't know whether they're unexplainable. I usually can find natural explanations for them. Uh, for instance, when I, uh, I lived in an apartment for, a, for about a year, mm -hmm. and uh, things would happen in that apartment that that pushed the limits of explainability. Uh, the television would turn on by itself. That happened on a few occasions. The bed, and if, if anyone knows me, uh, they'll admit to this. I, I don't usually, I'm not uh, the neatest person in the world. I don't always make my bed very um, uh, well every morning. But one day I came home from uh, work and my bed was completely made like you know, some, like someone made it, and I can't remember making it. Um, and there were some other just weird happenings, and I, and I could explain all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, the apartment was in a house with several other apartments. The infrared beams of a television remote could, you know, rebound across windows and through, through walls. Uh, the bed, maybe I woke up and, and actually did make the bed and didn't remember Doors would close in that apartment as well. Was it a draft? Was I sleepwalking? All of those I, I try to explain. But, you know, I'm still not totally convinced either way. I'm not convinced it was a natural thing. I'm not convinced it was a supernatural thing. So I think that's kind of how I approach this. And I do approach my stories more as a journalist who is trying to gather information from as many sides as possible and, and just putting it out there for the reader to decide. And usually, hopefully, the reader's uh, just about as confused as I am. And uh, I think that's a great place to be because I think that that makes these stories more alive and more exciting. Explanation, Wayne. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, Matt Swain is our special guest. Yep. And if you'd like to contact him, his Facebook is facebook.com forward slash uh, facebook.com forward slash pages forward slash haunted dash rock ha uh, dash and dash roll. If my memory serves me correct, the Beatles were into um, the paranormal as well. That's true. And it, the, the interesting thing for me about rock and roll is that I consider rock and roll uh, an outsider art. In other words, the people that are attracted to rock and roll, the artists that are attracted to rock and roll, tend to come from the fringes of society, from the fringes economically, from the fringes sociologically speaking. Uh, so I think rock artists um, are more likely to pick up um, you know, alternative spiritual paths than you know, mainstream artists. And the Beatles are that way as well. I mean, when you consider that 
the heart of music in England was uh, in London and the Beatles were from Liverpool. Uh, the heart of, of rock and roll wasn't even in England. It was in the United States. Mm -hmm. So the Beatles kind of approached music uh, as outsiders. And when they became into the mainstream, you'll see them how they adopted uh and they embraced uh, different spiritual systems beyond, you know, mainstream Christianity and such. But they uh, looked at, um, they did look at the occult. Uh, and in, in fact, Aleister Crowley, who I talked about, he's uh, one of the people who featured in Sgt. Pepper's. Uh, but also they uh, adopted a lot of uh, Eastern mysticism. So there are all kinds of uh, stories about that. There mm -hmm. are a lot of stories about uh, the premonitions that John Lennon had with the number nine, uh, which appears in several of his songs, uh, the one after 909 and number nine dream. And he dies, I think he just dies on December 8th, but in Liverpool it was the 9th. So that nine keeps cropping up. So there are a lot of stories like that. Um, the other uh, story that I found out uh, rather recently, uh, and if I do a sequel, I'm probably going to talk a little bit about it in there, is that uh, I had to get a seance together uh, with the rest of the Beatles and, and some of his friends mm -hmm. when um, Brian Epstein, their manager, died uh, tragically. Uh, so, you know, those guys uh, really embraced, um, you know, the occult and, and different uh, spiritual systems. How about curses? Um didn't did Buddy Holly have a curse, or was there an alleged curse when it came to Buddy Holly? There was an alleged curse of Buddy Holly, and it's pretty fascinating. Um, you know, when Buddy Holly died, mm -hmm. it, they considered it uh, the day the music died, and that was in, on February second, and it's celebrated and, and maybe mourned uh, to this day. But there was this odd. Um, effect that after he died, so many of the people that he was close with, friends with, musical allies with, uh, and musical legacies that were connected to um, Buddy Holly had uh, misfortunate uh, run-ins and, and deaths. Uh, Eddie Cochran, who was a, a, a big, a, a great friend of Buddy Holly, he dies tragically, actually in England, uh, in an automobile accident. Uh, I believe it was Ronnie Smith who was a backup singer on the tour, the Winter Dance Party tour that that Buddy Holly died during. He uh, ended up dying mm. tragically after a, a period of uh, mental health issues and drug and alcohol abuse. And then there are some other weird connections. Uh, for instance, uh, Ricky Nelson who died, um, and you might say, well, he died long after, you know, Buddy Holly died, and he wasn't really connected, but the last song that he played was a Buddy Holly song. Wow. And then Keith Moon, the drummer for The Who, mm -hmm. uh, the night before he died, he and his girlfriend, Paul McCartney and Linda, went to see a story. So there are, you know, maybe not dozens, but a lot of connections with this Buddy Holly story and these tragic rock and roll deaths. Could this just be the fact that they were so in the media that these were picked up and a lot of what we're seeing here is coincidence? Yeah, absolutely, that could be. Mm -hmm. The other thing that you have to remember is that um, the rock and roll lifestyle is uh, not the safest lifestyle uh, comparatively to, to other um, occupations. So uh, these people are probably engaging in higher risk uh, behaviors. Keith Moon made a living on high-risk behaviors. So, yeah, there is the possibility that that's a coincidence. But I do find the the number of times that Buddy Holly's name comes up in these other tragic deaths to be uh, a little more than uh, eyebrow-raising. Mm. So wh why do you think Buddy Holly was so pivotal in all of these events? You know, I don't know why he's so pivotal in in a an occult sense, mm -hmm. but he's so pivotal in a rock and roll sense. In that, uh, prior to Buddy Holly, rock stars, even Elvis, to a certain extent, was looked at more as an idol, more as an aberration rather than a real musician. And when Buddy Holly came along, 
uh, he brought a, an element of artistry. He was a mm -hmm. singer songwriter, and that inspired people like uh, the Beatles to yeah. to write their own songs and write their own rock rock music. So, you know, in that sense, he's kind of pivotal in rock and roll history. And if you want to further go on from that, when he died, there was, uh, you know, almost like a psychic uh, rip in the tear of of rock fans that mm -hmm. they really lost something something great. So, you know, it wouldn't be a difficult or a, a far stretch to, to think that that didn't have some type of spiritual influence on the people around him and maybe even the people connected to him uh, through rock and roll history. You know, a lot of our guests talk about the vibrations and the vibrational um, and uh, spiritual connection. Music is vibration. Is it possible that this is what the connection is here, that because of these musicians, they touched the masses through their vibrational abilities, and when they themselves passed on, that vibration could be felt? I, I think that is a possibility. Yeah. And certainly, if you if you think about it, there isn't one type of religion or mm -hmm. spiritual uh, belief system uh, that doesn't use rock and or I'm sorry, doesn't use music as an element. Whether it's hymns, uh, gospel music, chanting, drums and rhythms. So music is deeply connected. The one thing I learned from writing this book is that music and spirituality are deeply, deeply connected, if not the same thing. Well, it has been, uh, it has been noted over time that you know, music has a definite effect on people, their moods. Uh, gosh, an, an example would be the New Age music, how people find it so soothing and so relaxing and compared to the headbanging music. And mm -hmm. the hard rock music. Um, look, let's go back to the '60s before your time. Okay. Um, I I I remember in the '60s I was a teenager, you know, and uh, during '67 that would, you know, that I look at as being the pivotal part in my youth. Mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, Expo '67. I'm originally from Montreal, so we had Expo '67. We had all this international flavor coming into the city. We had. Uh, coffee clubs, we had pubs, we had the Battle of the Bands in high school. It was music was the center of our little universe back then. Everybody wanted to be in a Beatle band. Everybody wanted to have Beatle boots. Everybody wanted to have a Rickenbacker. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and then we look what happens on Sundays in church. That music that is played, how it brings people together for an hour and mm -hmm. unifies people. The national anthem, how it instills pride in people. So you know what? I believe, like you, that music is the underscored hero and the underscored force that keeps a lot of people together. I, I agree. And furthermore, rock and roll, which is, a, you know, musicologists will, will tell you is a you know, a unique musical blend of mm. African-American yep. musical styles, European, uh, white American musical styles, whether you're talking about blues, rhythm and blues, folk, country, all came together in, in this, this melting pot of rock and roll. Um, and so also I think it, it has a kind of a, a unique mystical heritage when we talk, you know, as we talk here, mm -hmm. we talk about Robert Johnson, an African-American uh, and we talk about, uh, you know, Led Zeppelin's Jimmy Page, who's, you know, from England, who, who talks a lot about Celtic uh, magic in, in his work. So it, 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 it is a blend of music and it's a blend of spirituality. Exo Nation, Matt Swain is our special guest. And uh, if you'd like to find out more about Matt, his uh, Facebook page is forward slash pages, forward slash haunted dash rock ha uh, dash and dash roll. Um, do they have to put the numbers behind the, uh, the name, Robert? Uh, I'm sorry, Matt. I, I don't know. I, I, I doubt it. I, I usually just go into Facebook and, and, uh, search for haunted rock and roll. Oh, there and it you usually go. pops right up. And, uh, I can, I guess that can also reach you at your, uh, your, your personal page at Matt Swain. 
Sure, that'd be fine. I have a pic- my uh, profile picture is Benny Hill, so don't be uh, thrown off by that. Now there was a guy I loved Benny Hill. Yeah, he was the greatest. He he was he was uh, you know like we've got to take a break at the bottom of the hour, but first of all, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for being a musical paranormal historian for us tonight. You're welcome. And I look forward to chatting with you on the other side of the short break. Okay, Exo Nation. Matt and I will be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the Exxon from our broadcast center. We're right here in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. Show with Rob McConnell. Gibbs A. Williams, PhD, is a practicing psychoanalyst, supervisor, researcher, and author in New York City. Much of his life has been dedicated to understanding nature and the uses of meaningful coincidences or synchronicities. His radical and original non Jungian, non mystical, non magical theory of synchronicities illuminates much of the fog surrounding this challenging and perplexing topic. His ideas and manners are fresh, presented in a style that is both entertaining and highly informative. He is also an expert on crisis intervention, specially focused on violence reduction for the police and citizens, mastering anxiety, frustration, and stress without the use of medication, and effectively preventing and treating heroin addiction. Dr. Williams can be contacted at his email address at gwwilliamsny11 at aol.com or visit his website at www.drgibbswilliams.com. Join High Tech with Corey K. Weekly here on the Exxon Broadcast Network. From the world of computers to the ever-popular computerized gadgetry that are becoming part of our everyday life and living and society. From kids and their gaming devices, teens and their smartphones, to the applications of personal and business computers. From hardware to software, from standalone units to network computers. Join high-tech guru Corey K. weekly right here on the Exxon Broadcast Network as he takes on the topics that will be of use and great value to the international audience of the Exxon Broadcast Network. High Tech with Corey K. weekly at 9 p.m. Eastern, only on the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. This is Kevin Randall. For nearly 30 years, I have been investigating the case of the Roswell UFO. I have interviewed hundreds of people and stood on the crash site. Now in Roswell in the 21st century, I have reviewed dozens of hours of audio and videotaped interviews, examined hundreds of files that relate to the crash, and have returned to Roswell in an attempt to put all that information into the proper perspective. For the first time in Roswell in the 21st century, I have made a dispassionate reevaluation of all that material and provide a new look at what happened. This is a book that clears away all the clutter that has hidden the truth for so long, strips away the various lies that surround the case, exposes the Air Force attempts at cover-up, and found a core of solid information that tells us all where the case stands today. Roswell in the 21st Century will be available in just a few weeks. For more information, please visit my website at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exome Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, High Tech with Corey Kay, and every minute of the 24-7, 365 programming of the Exome Broadcast Network by calling 712-432-9459, courtesy of TalkStream Live. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. 
call 712-432-9459 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember, 712-432-9459 for the best of paranormal, new age, thought-provoking sci-fi radio programming 24-7, 365. pursues fact, magic accesses the quantum level, bridging random facts to form truth. As long as science and magic remain separate and polarized, the truth cannot be known. I'm Wilda Wiecka. Join me on the Science of Magic radio program dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. During each episode, I'll be speaking with experienced and respected scientists and mystics. From astrologers to astronomers, from medical doctors to shaman, the scientific method to dowsing and intuition, we will weave together information from seemingly divergent practices to promote unity and enlightenment. Join me, Wilda Wiaka, and the Science of Magic right here on the Exxon Broadcast Network. For more information, visit www.thescienceofmagic.net. And welcome back, everyone. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. Uh, before we get back to our guest, Matt Swain, just a programming note here on uh, the Exxon. As you know, now we're on from 11 o'clock at night until 2 o'clock in the morning. Well, because of your requests to bring the show back to four hours, the networks have asked us to bring back the show to four hours. So starting in September, because you, the members of the Exxon Nation, have asked, the Exxon will be going back to our schedule that we had before the summer and that we've had for 25 years. We're going back to Monday through Friday from 10 p.m. Eastern until 2 a.m. Eastern. And then the shows from the vault will continue from 2 a.m. Eastern until 6 a.m. A.M. Eastern on all our affiliates and all our networks. So there you go, Exxon Nation. You have spoken. I listened. And because you have been so faithful over 25 years and done so much for so many, this is the very least I could do for you. So thank you, Exxon Nation. Matt Swain is our special guest this hour. And uh, if you'd like to find out more about Matt, all you have to do is... Just go to Facebook and search Haunted Rock and Roll, or you can go to his personal uh, Facebook page at uh, facebook.com forward slash Matt Swain. And uh, I love the idea of Benny Hill. Do you remember yes. his the other show that was on, uh, Dave Allen? I do remember yeah. Dave Allen. Yes. I, I love that whole era of yep. especially the English and Irish comedians. They were great. They yeah. were great, and I loved the end of the Benny Hill where they played Yakety Sax. Yes, and you know he'd be running. Uh, they did it in, in, yeah. in you know, and, and he'd be running after the women. Him and the women, like it was, it was phenomenal. And apparently, and apparently, Benny Hill was a real nice guy. He lived in a modest apartment, not very far from the studios. Uh, he was very friendly with the people he met. He was never. Uh, you know, super big headed. He liked people, and um, you know that's kind of people that that we need more of these days. And and Dave, uh, Dave, um, oh my gosh, what was his name? Dave Allen. Yeah, God, I've got a good memory. It's just very short yeah. these days. Yeah, uh, he was the same. And when we look at some of the the mega stars we have today, boy, they could take a good lesson from the uh, from the oldies yeah. and the goldies. Right. There's the story of Benny Hill how he. Uh, he would take a, a, a lady who was uh, handicapped and he would take her to the seaside and, yeah. and push her, push her uh, wheelchair uh, up and down the boardwalk. There, he, he was just an amazing guy. And uh, 
and loved comedy as yeah. was his great love. Not being a star, but the comedy itself. And he was excellent at it. Yes. And you know who else I like? Dame Edna. Now that I'm, I'm not sure of. All right, that's the one who's actually a guy who dresses up, and she she's from Australia, or he's from Australia. Okay. And uh, you know he they go on he go. How do you? I I have a problem with that. He she it whatever. Yeah. You know, and uh, she goes on stage, and uh, she always wears these gaudy outfits, these oh. big glasses, and anyway, check her out. I'm sure you'd appreciate okay, her comedy if if you like Benny Hill and Dave Allen. I do. Why do you think in the year 2016, you're in the media, mm-hmm. why do you think so many people are drawn to the paranormal? Why do you think it is still such a hot topic? And in my opinion, the reason why it's so hot is because of Penn State paranormal. I, I have a few theories about that. Um, and again, as I approach this, uh, my, my work as, as a journalist and as kind of an amateur folklorist, I've always loved folklore. Mm-hmm. And I've always been fascinated about how stories are created and how stories are um, divulged throughout cultures. I find it fascinating that uh, it, at Penn State, for example, we have ghost stories that are probably almost 100 years old. Wow. Um, so how did they exist prior to the Internet? Uh, and it's through this, this you know, one person telling another person, another person telling another person and correcting it and massaging these stories uh, over a long period of time. With the paranormal, I think we've kind of reached a place where uh, the Internet community and things like what you're doing is bringing this, these groups together and uh, letting people tell their stories to a mass audience. And now I think that's kind of how these stories are percolating. Um, I think they always existed. Mm -hmm. I think they always will exist. But now there's sort of a spotlight on it. Uh, Yeah, plus back then people used to communicate. Stories used to be told around campfires and uh, passed down from generation to generation and, and kept alive. But one thing I have learned doing this show is that those people who do ghost research or in hauntings, investigations, and so on, they are communicators and they are also historians because these people go and they dig through the, through the background of the location, they get the entire history, and they write about it, they talk about it, they, they video it, they podcast mm-hmm. it. You know, it's just wonderful to see history being kept alive by the younger generation. Right. And, you know, as I write these these books, it is a learning experience for me. Mm-hmm. I think the first book that I wrote, uh, which was the Haunted Rock, or I'm sorry, the uh, America's Haunted Universities, mm-hmm. uh, I pretty much approached it purely as folklore uh, and uh, as a journalist, as I, as I said before. Uh, but in the Haunted Rock and Roll book, I stretched it out a little bit and I tried to contact... Because to be honest with you, I've never gone on uh, any uh, a, a ghost investigation or anything like that. I mean, to me, the hours are really kind of terrible uh, yeah. to be mucking around an old house <laughs> at three in the morning. But this time I reached out to as many uh, people as I could just to sometimes just get the background of a story. Sometimes I would talk to people who visited those locations. And what I found too to every single person I talk to, a uh, mm-hmm. paranormal researcher, ghost hunter, ghost buster, whatever you want to call them, is they approach their, uh, their craft or they approach their research in a very serious manner. And they were, and, and I'm working on a, a book about country ghosts. And again, I reached out to some folks who were involved in those hauntings who investigated it. Mm-hmm. And, and they were, you know, in a lot of cases, I think they are far more uh, willing to find natural explanations than I am. Between you and me, if uh, light would pop right now, I would immediately uh, say it was a poltergeist. Right. Um, but the, the folks that I talk to are very serious and very sincere about what they're doing. And I, I think that that means a lot. You know, my, mind you, doing television myself and radio, 
Uh, I must say that a lot of these so-called reality TV shows are anything but reality. Mm -hmm. And I think that they're doing a great disservice to, to the viewers by pretending that everything they do is real. Yeah, yeah, and I, I wonder, because I, I know some of those folks, and then sometimes you wonder how much is edited, how much mm -hmm. is, you know, uh, you know, pressed by the, the pub, um, you know, the company involved or the, the director or whatever. Yeah, I agree. So let me see, some of the, you know, your books vary. They, they're within the paranormal theme, but we talked about your book, Haunted Rock and Roll Americas, Haunted Universities, Haunted Valley, The Ghost of Penn State, Paranormal mm -hmm. Pit Ghosts of, of Country Music. Um, you go right over the spectrum. Are there any similarities that you have come across that link all these ghost stories together? That that's a great question, and and you know one that I haven't thought a lot about, but you know as you mentioned this, the, you know the the line that goes goes through this is this idea of spiritual exploration, and really the idea of what I call the liminal, and by that I mean when let's let's talk about university ghost stories. You know, the times that they appear usually at night on a, you know, a dark campus, uh, you're alone in an old building, that's kind of a liminal area, an area where we're at between re reality and imagination. And uh, rock and roll ghost stories, likewise, I think rock and roll has kind of a liminal aspect. You can even talk about the psychedelic era, mm -hmm. about you know, pushing consciousness to that place where reality and imagination, uh, you know, are indiscernible. Um, I find with the country music ghost stories that I've I've come across that they too have this liminal aspect. Um, so I think if you want to talk about uh, ghost stories in general, mm -hmm. you really find this. Uh, area, this liminal area where we've pushed our knowledge to kind of the limit, and then we have to rely on things like, you know, our spiritual belief systems, our intuition, our imagination to make sense of what's the next step beyond reality. So those are, I think that would be a, a tie that binds those together. Is it possible then that the new paranormal interest is mm -hmm. actually people looking for the next stage in the evolution of religion that's that is yeah that's plausible and i i think that is is absolutely true and you know we can take this back to what john lennon said mm -hmm. and he was you know he was really maligned for saying that uh the beatles were bigger than jesus and the people interpreted that as um, that he was saying that he was better than Jesus, that the Beatles were more popular yes. than Jesus. But what he was saying was really a slam on the Beatles. He was saying, you know, these kids are finding kind of a spiritual yeah. outlet beyond religion. Uh, so the whole paranormal field, you know, that exploration of the liminal, that exploration of their own spirituality is 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 pretty evident. And the people that are attracted to it, maybe the people that don't go... Uh, out you know, muck around in houses at three in the morning, but watch it at, at night. They too are trying to explore their own spiritual uh, limitations mm -hmm. and, and and beyond. Where do you think the interest in paranormal is going to go? Do you think that it's going to fizzle out like it has in the past, or do you think this time, because of the internet, because of the interest, because of the radio shows, the television shows, the articles? like you write, that the paranormal is here to stay in the, in, the, in the magnitude that it is today and draw more and more and more people to it? I think the paranormal, as, as we see it today, I think it is going to ebb and flow like it usually does. Um, you know, I think that these stories will continually crop up, uh, ghost stories continually crop up. And are going to be spread throughout the internet and it's going to reignite and then it might get a little boring and then it'll reignite. But what I'm starting to see 
in general, maybe let's go beyond the paranormal and, mm -hmm. and talk about um, how science, technology, quantum physics, the, the deeper you go into those areas, the more it starts sounding like spirituality. Um, you know, I find that in my reading, both as my, you know, my day job as a, as a research writer, uh, to some of the things I come across when I'm researching these books. So I'm, I'm wondering that maybe eventually these things are going to really start to connect. And, and you wonder whether, you know, maybe some of the overblown, you know, kind of paranormal television stuff doesn't start to unite with uh, more uh, rational approaches um, and, and, pushing, and pushing those, those limits. That's just an idea. When you go out and um, meet people and they find out that you're an author that deals in the paranormal, what are some of the questions mm -hmm. you get? You know, it's not the, it's not the questions I get. Uh, usually they, they come to me uh, hoping I can help them with oh, their wow. um, uh, ghostly activities in their houses. That, that comes up a lot. Um, and to be honest with you, uh, they, these people... Really, the, the stories that I get in these books are, you know, 10% of the freakiness that I get from a lot of these people. And, you know, earlier I said that I'm a skeptic, but, but meeting these people require and push me because they're, you know, they seem very rational. They don't seem like they're, they have mental illness. They, they sometimes are somewhat embarrassed to tell me their stories. But but really, what I, I get from it is I have to have an open mind about it. I I am forced to listen to people who have had uh, experiences that I find very hard to explain in a in a rational, natural world. Uh, so it it kind of pushes me uh, to keep my mind open. So usually, I get a lot of people ask me, you know, how why did I write the book, yeah. uh, and they ask me my own. Uh, experiences but then they'll they'll lay on me some of the creepiest stories that that you can imagine all right yeah i have to ask you this what is the uh -huh. creepiest story that somebody has told you well th this one that that immediately comes to mind is this this lady and i was at a book signing and um she told me that she was never a believer uh her husband was never a believer but they went to uh, an antique shop or maybe an auction and they bought a chair and they put it in a room. It was an antique chair. And uh, I think it may have been in the bedroom of one of their children. And suddenly their, the one child refused to go in the room and would talk about seeing a, a man in the chair and, uh, there was apparently a lot of other activity that started to crop up around that. So they decided to get rid of the chair. And the really freaky part was she mm -hmm. told me that when they were trying to get the chair or her husband was trying to get this chair into their car or their truck, which it easily fit in when they got it out, it seemed like the chair was fighting with him. And uh, had smacked him a couple times when he tried to put it in, and it was just one of the weirdest stories I've heard. And this lady was completely believable. Wow. You know, I've often wondered if people go to yard sales and, uh, and antique auctions, if they ever bring anything home that was attached to that piece of furniture. This would certainly be a case of that. Yeah. Um, and then I said... <laughs> That poor person who bought it at the, the auction you sent it to, I wonder <laughs> if they have any stories. Wow. What are your final thoughts for the members of the Exxon Nation tonight? I, uh, you know, I just really appreciate the people who, um, you know, enjoy this sort of thing. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm going to keep on exploring these uh, stories. I find it fascinating uh, I'm always willing uh, to, to listen to these stories, too. And if, if anyone wants to reach out and give me their story or maybe they have a rock and roll uh, haunted ghost story to tell me, uh, I would love to talk about it. Let our listeners know where they can get your books, my friend. 
uh, Barnes and Noble. It's usually uh, in Barnes and Nobles. Uh, it's on Amazon.com and it's also on BarnesandNoble.com uh, and any uh, bookstore near you. And if they don't have it, please ask for it. Here's a question for you. This is the final question because I'm dying to find out. Mm. What would you do if you saw a ghost? I know I would freak out. I know I would. I, uh, as I've said before, I'm I'm not very qualified. Even though with my Halloween birthday background, yeah. you would think that I would be willing to embrace this, but that would be the shock of my life, and I think that would cause some deep existential questions. Do you believe in life after death? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I don't know whether I believe in it in the way that, um, you know, I think common thought is that it's a very linear process. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I have a, a more of an Eastern religion background. Uh, so I don't know whether we exist in, in this kind of linear fashion. I think maybe there is this multidimensional fashion. I, I agree with you. I agree with you on that. How about a reincarnation? Well, again, I, I think reincarnation means you die and then mm -hmm. you're, you're reborn. But, you know, and this sounds a little weird, but uh, I think that kind of life uh, exists on all planes at all time and that it's just really our consciousness dividing that up into a, a way to kind of understand it better, which to us would be this linear process. See, my definition of reincarnation is, or how I explain it to some people is, it's the green recycling bin of the universe. Oh, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I want to thank you very much for joining us tonight. It's been a great pleasure. Do me a favor. Come back again and uh, chat with us. And I would uh, love to. And we're doing a Halloween's week, and I'd love to have you back on during that week. Since your birthday is Halloween, we can kill two pumpkins with one toss. One knife. There yeah. you go. Okay. Thanks again for joining us. It's been a great pleasure. Exxon Nation, if you'd like to find out more about Matt Swain, his uh, Facebook page is forward slash Matt Swain, and you can just uh, Google him on uh, Google, and uh, there you go. Great topic, great books. Wish him much success. Now I'll be back on the other side of this commercial break with our features as we continue here in the Exome from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. If you'd like to send an email, it's very simple, Exome Nation. You know the email address by now. After 25 years, you should. Exome at exoneradiotv.com. Speaking about TV, if you'd like to see all of season one of the Exome TV show, We've got them available free of charge. We don't charge for our TV shows. We don't charge for our archives because we want the word to get out. We want the word and the meanings and what our, what our guests talk about. We want to share that information with the world. And I don't think any radio show should charge. It's a disservice to the listeners. It's a disservice to the guest. And if a radio show or a podcast needs to advertise, uh, I'm sorry, needs to charge people for their podcast or their shows, all that does is show me that they're in dire need and they're not doing that great. Mind you, that's only my opinion. So all you have to do is go to www.xzonetv.com. All 12 episodes from 2015, that was our season one. We're already in the planning stage for season two. We should start shooting sometime this fall, the people tell me. In season one, we talked to, let me see, some of the people, uh, Steve Bassett about the truth embargo, Stanton T. Friedman about Roswell, uh, psychic, the psychic lawyer, Mark Anthony, Dr. Joe Mara. We talked to Rose Rose Tree, the international uh, face reader. These are just some of the people that we spoke to about the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology. As I said, I'll be back on the other side of this commercial break as we continue here in the X Zone from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. My name is Rob McConnell. Don't go away. <laughs> <laughs> 